breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king above all kings Who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me for answers far and wide 
so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. I'm so excited to be here with you all. I, like I said earlier, my name is Brianna, and I have been a missionary. I just completed my very first term. Last time I was here with you all was about two years ago, and I was just getting started. So I wanted to share with you all a little bit, a little update before we jumped into the message today. So I was in Cote d'Ivoire, in English, it's Ivory Coast. So it's in West Africa. And I was at base camp, which is basically training camp for missionaries. So we're going there to learn language, to learn culture, and how to do missions. And we were able to do many different projects during the time that I was there. So on the next slide are just a few of the different um, things that I was able to do. So you see here, I, there were six big projects or big ministries that I was able to be involved in because of your faithful support and because of your prayers. The first one on the slide there is called One Hope. One Hope is a non-for-profit organization where we're able to go into public schools um, each week and do skits for the kids and then hand out evangelism materials called the Book of Hope that presented the gospel to kids at their level. So we had one for little kids and older kids. So that was one of our opportunities. And one of the things that I loved about One Hope is that they also have an evangelism film that presents the gospel. And in the evenings, we were able to do the video in the neighborhoods, and we can even start Bible clubs out of those evangelism events. So Bible clubs was another ministry that I was a part of. It was the one that was near and dear to my heart. Um, every Saturday, we would go and share Bible stories with kids in the community. We were able to connect with their families. And we would sing songs of worship and praise to God. And it was really exciting to me because it wasn't just Christian kids. It was kids all throughout the community. So it was really evangelism. Sunday school ministry was another huge part of what I did. So part of my job was working with the national church and I focus on children's ministry. So I worked with teachers in the churches. I learned from them as I learned how to do children's ministry in Africa, and they learned from me as I was able to share creative teaching ideas and, um, and help them to, to grow what they were doing in their Sunday schools already. I was able to work in two different Sunday schools, two different churches. So I spent one year with one church and one year with another. So it was really um, exciting, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I had to learn. We also did English club. So one of our churches came to me and my friends before becoming a missionary. I was a teacher for 10 years. And so they wanted to capitalize on that skill. And my friend is an English major. So we worked together to start an English club in one of the churches. And the schools in Africa, they take many different languages and English is one of them. So they wanted to help their students be successful. So English club was an exciting opportunity that we got to do. We also did many different types of evangelism. So we would partner with local churches who were trying to start a new church or have a new church plant. And we would go into the village with them and do a two day kids program. So the first day was all about salvation. And then the second day, we would talk about what it means to be a Christian and to live a Christian life. 
We did puppets and songs and dances and tons of games. It was always very, very fun. And it was so amazing to see kids come to Christ through these evangelism events. And then we would hold evangelism events in the evening for the adults. And then one of the last projects that I was able to take part in because of your faithful giving is a compassion project that we did with a, um, with a village that was close to where we lived that really struggled with clean water. So they had a lot of illnesses, a lot of sicknesses due to dirty drinking water. And we partnered with Africa Oasis, which is the compassion branch of Assemblies of God Mission in Africa. And we were able to, you can see in this picture, this is one of the water filters. Uh, we were able to train 10 leaders in their local church to be able to teach people how to do simple things like wash their hands effectively so that they weren't transmitting germs. We um, taught them how to assemble the filters, how to clean them, how to teach other people how to do that too. We also trained them in how to do devotions when they went into people's homes. So not only Christian people were receiving these, they were people throughout the whole community. So every time these leaders are going in and giving a filter, they're also presenting the gospel. They're praying with families. So it's an evangelism um, tool as well as meeting the felt need of this community. So we were able to pass out 200 water filters with this project. Yeah, really changing the lives of people, giving them what they need physically as well as um, what they need spiritually. I wanted to share just a short testimony of Bible Club. So I, like I told you, Bible Club was one of my very favorite ministries that I was able to do. So on the next slide, I have a picture of one of my little friends here. I've circled him in green. This is my friend Nathan. And Nathan started coming to Bible Club from the very first day. He was so excited to be there. He was always super engaged with what we were doing, raising his hand, wanting to answer all the questions about the Bible stories. And one day I was teaching and Nathan was sitting next to me in a chair and he's about 10 or 11 years old. So he's kind of a silly boy and he fell out into the middle of all the kids. And I was like, Nathan, what are you doing? And so I got closer. I'm like, okay, man. And I quickly realized that he wasn't messing around. He was seizing. He was, his body was convulsing. His eyes were rolling back in his head. He's foaming at his mouth. And I was like, oh Lord. There could be a couple of things happening here. Um, witchcraft is very prevalent, and so demon possession is prevalent. So it could be this, it could be seizures. So I'm praying, and I'm like, okay, God, will you please help me to know what we do for him right now? And I felt like the Lord was telling me he's having a seizure. And just so happened that day, the Lord had placed one of my teammates with me at Bible Club who, before becoming a missionary, worked in an epileptic specialty clinic as a nurse for 10 years. So the Lord knew that the situation was going to happen and he wanted to intervene into Nathan's life. So we got him safe. We were able to talk to him afterwards and this wasn't the first time that he had had a seizure. So we went and talked with his family, his parents, and um, it was just so heartbreaking as we were having conversations with them. These parents who are worried about their kid don't know what's happening. They don't have the money to take him to a doctor. They would have to travel very far away to be able to go to a clinic that would be able to treat something like this. And then even if they got like a diagnosis, they don't have the money for daily medication that he would need for his epileptic um, seizures that were happening more and more frequently. And as we were walking away, I was just so broken for Nathan. And I was talking to my friend. I was like, "Is like, how serious is this? She's like, it's pretty serious. I was like, okay. So we have to pray because God is the only one who can intervene in this situation. So we started praying for Nathan that God would heal him. And a couple of weeks later, it was my turn to share the Bible story. And I was preaching on, um, or I was sharing with them stories of Jesus healing people, healing the woman with a blood disorder, healing um, or delivering the kid who was demon possessed. All of these different stories of God's power and how he still works in power today. So I was preparing and I was like, okay, Lord, Nathan needs you to work in power in his life. Nathan needs you to heal him from this because he has no other way. So what do we do? And I felt like the Lord was asking me to have the kids practice what we're talking about. The children would lay their hands on one another and pray for each other's healing. So that's what we did. I did the message. We got everyone up and whoever was sick, we... Uh, um, laid our hands on them, and I reminded the kids that we pray in faith, believing that God will do what he promised he'll do. And after praying for Nathan, 
I didn't see him for a couple of weeks. He wasn't there and I was worried about him. I was like, okay, let's see what's going on. And after he returned a few weeks later, he quietly shared with one of our leaders who spoke better French than me um, that, that he hadn't had any more seizures since that day that we prayed for him. And our leader was encouraging him, you need to share this testimony because God has healed you and you need to share it with other people so that they can believe too. And he was nervous that day, but he came back the next week, still hadn't had any seizures. And he shared with his friends how God had healed him, how God had intervened in his life. And I was so excited. I was like, yes, God, you still work. You still move. We have a God that is powerful and that moves in people's hearts and lives. And um, even before I left, I left in February. Um, I left in, at the end of March. So it was about the end of March. I saw him in the street and he still hadn't had any seizures since that time. So it's been over six months that he's been seizure free and the Lord delivered him. And so I wanted to share that testimony with you. Thank you. Thank you for praying and supporting because of that. We got to be there for Nathan um, and to share God with him and to be able to pray with him. So thank you. The, your support for missionaries and your prayers for missionaries are changing people's lives around the world. So that is my testimony of, um, of part of the work that God started and is doing in Ivory Coast. And um, now I was going to share, I am going to a new field now. I'm not going to take a bunch of time. On the next slide, it talks a little bit about where I'm going. I'd love to share with you afterward. Um, I'm going to a new country called Senegal. So I was in training camp mode. Now I'm getting sent out to my mission field. So I'll be transitioning to Senegal in July. I leave July 21st, so it's coming up quickly. Um, please continue to pray for me. I'd love to tell you more about what I'm doing afterwards if you're interested. Um, but now we're going to go ahead and transition into the message today. I'm so excited to share with you all. I, As you can tell, I learned a lot in my first term on the field. Not only did I learn practical things about life, but I also learned better how to hear the voice of God. And as I've been praying, I've been praying for a long time for these services and what I would speak, what God wanted to speak to the churches um, that I would visit. And so today he's asked me to be vulnerable with you and to share with you the lesson that he was teaching me during the last year of mission. And that lesson was how to go from doing ministry and doing mission to living every moment of my life on mission. For Christ. And that probably seems pretty weird that a missionary would need that lesson in their lives. But I think that it's something that um, the Lord can always continue to take us deeper in. So we're going to pray and then we will get started. Okay. All right, God, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak today. I thank you for each person that's in this room that you've brought here. I thank you for every heart. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would make us sensitive to your Holy Spirit today, that you would speak to hearts, that you um, would encourage us where we need encouragement, that you would convict us in places that we need to be convicted, God, and that you would change our hearts and our lives today as we are eager to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name. So God started speaking to me about the mission, living on mission for Christ, and what that looked like about a year ago. We were doing some training in Ivory Coast. It's about half Christian, half Muslim population. So we're doing training on how do we minister to Muslim people? How do we do one on one evangelism? And um, at the end of the week, we we're going to go out and we we're going to practice what we had been learning. And here's my vulnerable, vulnerable part. I was really, really nervous about doing this. One on one evangelism is not something that I had done a lot in my life. It's not. Um, something that I'm super comfortable with. I'm a little, I'm introverted. I like to be quiet. I don't like to talk to strangers. It like really freaks me out. So thinking about going up to someone that I don't know and then trying to start a conversation with them, scary. Then trying to turn this conversation somehow into Jesus was so overwhelming. And I was like experiencing all of this anxiety. And it was kind of just like a nightmare. I was like, oh no, I do not want to do this, but I should want to do this. The Lord, why don't I want to do this? You know, I was like having this inner struggle. And as we were going through our training, I noticed that some of my friends were super excited. Some of us were a little bit more hesitant. Um, and one of my really good friends named Marilyn, the day that we're going out, so I'm walking beside her and I'm like, okay, Lord, 
we've got the Holy Spirit in us. We can do this, you know, like speak to me, like help me know what to say. But my friend was standing next to me and she was just smiling and had so much joy. And she's like, Brianna, today is the day of salvation. We get to go out today and partner with Christ. We get to go out and speak to someone about who Jesus is and their life could change today. Today is the day of salvation. I was like, conviction straight to the heart right i'm here like freaked out she's like yes we get to partner with jesus and that began me on my quest to figure out like lord what's happening what does it really mean to live on mission what is the mission that you're calling us to so we're going to look at two different verses today and um, the first one's going to be in acts 1 8 and then the second one is going to be in matthew 28 18 through 20. I think maybe if you go to the next slide. Oh, yes. Okay. So this is a picture of one of the times that we're going out to do some witnessing. So this is my witnessing story. And um, so one of the big questions that I asked myself is, what is the difference between me and my friends? And then it was really in her attitude that today is the day of salvation. So... Today, I'm going to share with you from Acts 1-8. So that's where we're going to start, Acts 1-8. And Acts has quickly, over the last year, become one of my favorite books of the New Testament. I took a class in Global and like really studied it, and I'm studying it again with one of my friends. But it's also spoke to me as I was looking at the mission of Christ. What is the point of being a Christian? What are we supposed to be doing? How are we supposed to be living our lives? And in the book of Acts, we get such a clear picture of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. So let's look at um, verse 8. So right before this, in the book of Acts, um, the author is Luke. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, which goes through the whole life of Jesus, his ministry, his um, death, his resurrection. And Acts picks up after Jesus has risen from the dead. He's teaching his followers for 40 days about the kingdom of God and how they're going to do this thing. How are they going to start the church? He's getting them ready. And he tells them that they're going to go to Jerusalem and they have to wait for the gift that the Father is giving them. And that gift is the Holy Spirit. And then this is what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus, these are his last words when he ascends to heaven. Jesus uses his very last words to tell us, to give us the mission. This is how you're supposed to live your life. First, we have to wait for the Holy Spirit. That is his very first instruction to us. We can't do this life. We can't do ministry. We can't tell people about Jesus unless we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us boldness in our lives to carry out the mission. He helps us to live holy lives before God. And he is the one, as we speak to people, he draws them in. He convicts hearts. And then it says that we must go out. We must go out and be witnesses, telling people everywhere, not in just some places in some moments, but go everywhere telling about Jesus and the salvation that they can find in him. Before I became a missionary, I was a teacher in the public schools. And I came and I sat in my chair, my spot at church. You know, I came and I learned. I learned how to live a holy life. I learned about Jesus. I served. I love serving. So I served in all the different ministries because service came easy to me. But every time that the pastor would start talking about witnessing to people and um, evangelizing, I would always get a little bit nervous because, like I said, stranger danger, right? Talking to strangers is kind of scary. But also because I also wondered, I got saved when I was seven years old. I wondered, you know, like, I don't have a crazy conversion story. Like, I don't have this moment like where everything changed. Praise God, I have a life of God's faithfulness, right? But I wondered, is my testimony compelling enough to make someone be like, oh yeah, I wanna follow Jesus? I was worried that maybe they'd ask me questions about the Bible and I wouldn't know all the answers about it. And I was stupid and I was like, you don't even know your religion. Or, you know, like I had all of these scenarios that would go on in my mind. So I decided that a better way for me personally to be a witness would be to live a holy life. And then people would see that I was living a holy life and they'd come to me and they'd ask me questions about it, right? So that would work out really well for me. I don't have to go to you, you're going to come to me. So I was willing to talk about Jesus, but I wasn't willing to go to other people. 
and start those conversations. And that, when I was talking with my friend, I began to wonder like, is that actually biblical though? Or is that something that I created for my own comfort? Jesus clearly tells us to go, not to wait for people to come to us. The words that he uses are active. We have to be active in our faith, not passive. So I began to investigate, what does it really mean to be a witness for Christ? And as I began to study, I found this article on a website called jesusfilm.org. And um, on jesusfilm.org, and it's called, What is Christian Witnessing? They have lots of articles if you're interested in looking more into witnessing. They have a ton on this website. But they summed it up really beautifully in their last paragraph, and it says, Our Christian witness is comprised of two parts. It's about telling others what Jesus has done for the world with an emphasis on our personal experience. And when I read that, I think for the first time, I started to see what witnessing could look like. It doesn't have to be me sharing this crazy story of how God saved me from drug addiction or things like that. But it was really telling the truth of who Jesus is. I can do that. I know who Jesus is. He's my savior. I can talk about how he's forgiven me of sin in my life. I can talk about how he's the healer. I have testimonies of healing. And then I share that story, right? I can talk about how God loves me and how he's been present with me in really difficult moments in my life. I can talk about how he's delivering me from anxiety, right? So I have these testimonies and I can place them on the character of who Jesus is. But it also says that witnessing is putting our transformation on display. The fruit of the spirit is the seal of authenticity that empowers our message. So it is also about living a holy life. I didn't get it completely wrong, which was a little bit of a relief. As I, I was reading this, I realized that witnessing is really twofold. It's speaking and it's living. I was more comfortable with one portion of it, the living part, and not so much with the speaking. I was living my faith before others, but I was expecting them to come and seek after what I have. Essentially, I was putting the entire responsibility of witnessing onto people who were lost. And then the Lord immediately brought to my mind the scripture in Romans 10, 14 that says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Yes, we need to live holy lives that prove the power of salvation. The way that we live our lives matters. Transformation that happens in our life as we seek God is the proof that sharing what we're sharing, the message that we're giving people is real. But we can't neglect seeking opportunities to speak and to share. We must also go. We have to go to our friends. We have to go to our family members, to our coworkers, to the people that we see. Our favorite um, waitress at the restaurant, right? She needs Jesus too. We have to go. We don't witness on accident very often. It has to be an intention of our heart. And this realization that I was fulfilling part of witnessing, but not the entire thing, led me into lots of prayer because I knew I needed to go, but I was still scared, right? It's like, what? I'm still scared about this though, God. So I need you to help me. And then as I was praying one day, I was listening to the song called Until All Have Heard. And the first line says, break my heart for the ones who are lost, who don't know of the work of the cross. And in that moment, God was revealing to me that I had lost my brokenness over the loss. Yes, I cared about the loss. I gave up my entire life to go to another place and to tell people about Jesus. But it was caring. It wasn't brokenness. I had compartmentalized. Right now we're doing evangelism. Right now we're doing Sunday school. But it wasn't every moment of my life, every person that I passed wondering, do you know Jesus? And a brokenness for that experience in their life of being lost and not knowing the goodness of, of my Savior. God gave me a picture in my mind. This is my actual Bible from high school, this picture here. And he asked me this question, do you remember? Do you remember this day, Brianna? Do you remember being filled with the Holy Spirit and the brokenness that you felt for people? I worked at the UPS store, which is the mailing store, and we had rush label stickers, right? So one day I was bored, like in between people, and I picked a sticker off and I put it on my Bible. And I wrote, are you in a rush to save souls? It's a very teenager thing. But at the same time, 
he was like, do you remember this? Do you remember that feeling in your heart of brokenness for people who don't know me, of people who are living in the midst of sin and who are searching for something to save them? Are you still in a rush to save souls? What had happened to my broken heart for the loss? Where I would walk by someone and wonder, do you know Jesus? Because you need to, right? He will change everything about your life. As I grew older, I had grown more distracted in my life. You know, you go to college, you're busy with all your classes and you're working. You graduate, you're getting your career. I was a teacher. It takes a lot of time. Teaching it takes up a lot of time. And I had become more worried and rushed to, to fill my to-do list and my task list than I had about the mission of Christ in my life. My mind was filled with responsibilities and chores and duties. And so there was no space for me to even think and slow down. And when I was uh, at the store or when I was with people like, do you know Jesus? And to really see the people that were around me. And after God revealed this to me, I knew I needed to pray and to seek that broken heart, to seek that broken heart for the lost, for the guard that was at my grocery store and for my lagoon lady or for the guy behind the deli. God was asking me to slow down and pay attention, to care more about other people's eternal soul than about my comfort. So I began to pray for that heart. And I continued studying. So next we're going to look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, because there's another piece of living life on mission that we sometimes forget. And here's what Jesus says. He says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And here again in this scripture, we see that the first command is for us to go. But Jesus wants us to take it a step further. He wants us to disciple people. This isn't just the job of your pastor or the leaders in your church. This is the job that he gave every single believer, right? We have to witness and we have to disciple people. He explains that making disciples, we do this by baptizing people who believe in him and then teaching them to obey all of the commands that he's given us. As I was researching, I found another article. Um, that talked about discipleship and it explained it this way. Discipleship is entering into relationship with people to help them to follow and trust Jesus. Discipleship is about reaching lost people and it's about helping people who are already Christians become fully obedient to God. But relationships take a lot of effort and they take a lot of intentionality. And discipleship is a long process. So I think we tend to avoid it sometimes because of all of the work that goes into it. We need to be showing people how to be followers of Jesus. We share our lives and lessons that we've learned, how we've overcome difficulty in our own lives, how we pray, and then we talk and we show up in people's lives and we live with them. The article goes on to say that disciple making is an expression of love. Disciple making is helping people. It is a natural, loving expression that's grounded in relationship, as Jesus showed us with his disciples. And it includes love, instruction, guidance, coaching, and more. We're not imposing something on other people. Instead, we're helping them by living our lives with them, by patiently explaining the gospel to them, by guiding, modeling, and supporting people and being able to follow Jesus. Sometimes we don't feel like we have something to offer other people. Maybe we don't have enough Bible knowledge. Maybe we don't think that we live a life that's good enough for someone to follow us yet. Other times we can't imagine where we would possibly find the time to invest into another person in this deep of a way. Some of you might be excited about making disciples. You love pouring into people's hearts and into their lives. But today I want to encourage you that no matter what phase of life you're in, if you're a new Christian, if you've been a Christian a long time, if you have lots of time, if you don't have much time at all, it is part of our mission. It is part of the command of God that we make disciples and help people to trust him and follow him. 
So maybe you're a parent, and in this season, God is asking you just to disciple your own kids in your home, not just investing in them to teach them about how to be a good person, helping them be successful at school, but really showing them what it looks like to follow Christ, what it looks like to do devotionals, what it looks like to pray, what it looks like to have questions about your faith and be able to find the answers. Maybe God is asking you to serve somewhere in a ministry. Maybe it's serving children or maybe it's serving youth. Discipling doesn't have to be really hard. Little kids, they don't need a lot of complex doctrine about the world, right? They need love. They need you to tell them the simple truths that you know. You can disciple someone. You can disciple someone. Maybe you're passionate about parenting and you can walk alongside a new couple that are becoming parents and you can show them how to be godly parents. Maybe you have a passion for sports or you have a passion for cars. You can start lots of different things where you can invest into people. One of my greatest joys working in the public schools was to be able to be on a team where I had a couple of other Christian people with me. You can disciple people in your job at work, right? So there's other Christians, and I had some that were younger than me. They would come to me, and they would ask me questions about the Lord, and we could read the Bible together. We could pray together about the different things that were happening. You don't have to go far to find someone that you can disciple. So what now? We know that we're called to be witnesses with our words and with our lives, and we're called to baptize and make disciples. But what does starting this process look like? How can we move forward into the next steps that God has for us? Because it can seem really, really overwhelming. So I want to encourage you today that it's a process. And I started really small with a question, right? It's a process. You don't have to leave here today and go evangelize the entire restaurant after service. But we can start to reflect on our hearts and our lives and start to ask God questions about um, where we're at, where we're at living this um this mission out for me for me it started with the question why am i afraid to witness to people one on one then it turned into a prayer that god would really break my heart for the lost and then it turned into a prayer of god when i go out please help me to see people help me to see where they're really at and then it became tell me who to talk to today give me a person and then it became actually talking to people it was a process it wasn't all overnight. One example of how God brought me to being able to be more comfortable evangelizing in South Africa in December, there was an all Africa conference. So all the missionaries in Africa are there. And it's really easy to take that as just like a fun vacation, right? But me and my friend were like, you know, we could go on vacation or we could still do that vacation. So as we were doing fun vacation things, like getting a pedicure, <laughs> Um, which is not something that I could get in Delta. Um, we, I was like, okay, I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to see what the Lord does. I'm going to be open and I'm going to start a conversation with the lady who's um, doing my pedicure. So we started talking just about life in general. And eventually she asked me about my job. Like, yeah, you know, I'm a missionary. So in that situation, you can go two ways. I could say I'm a teacher, right? I work with kids. Or I could be like, I'm a missionary. So I went that direction this time. And she began, as I told her, like, I teach kids about the Bible and about who Jesus is. She asked me, so do you understand the Bible? It's pretty confusing, right? And I was like, you're right. The Bible can be really confusing. It was like, it is hard. And so that opened up a conversation of talking to someone about how they can read their Bible, where they can find ways to understand their Bible better. That conversation didn't end in a sinner's prayer, but it did open up um, an opportunity for me to speak into her life what she actually needed. The Lord sees each person that we interact with and he sees what they need. Maybe they need prayer. Maybe they need to hear about Jesus for the first time. Maybe they need you to speak into their life about how they can understand their Bible better. It doesn't always have to be a salvation prayer right this second when you're witnessing to the people around you. So now um, I want to encourage you that the point is that we get excited to go out and we get excited to partner with Christ and bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. 
We must go out each day of our lives filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with boldness, and the intention that today could be the day of salvation for someone that we meet. Today could be the day that the Lord uses us in someone's life to speak to them. So we're going to take some time for prayer and reflection. And this is going to be your time with the Lord to see if there are any specific areas in your life that I've been talking about today that the Lord wants to grow you in. Maybe he wants to encourage you to be like, yeah, you're doing great at this. Maybe there's something else that he's like, here's the next step. Here's the next thing I want you to do. Here's the next person. Here's a person in your job that I want you to start praying for and praying for opportunities to speak to them. We're all in different places and God knows us and he sees us exactly where we are. So we're going to pray and seek the next steps that he's asking from us today. We're going to take about five minutes and um, even the next slide, I have questions for you. So these are just questions that I've asked myself throughout this process. You don't have to go through every single one. But if you're like someone who likes direction, pick something that speaks to you that you can talk to God about. And I'm going to share this song. Um, and so I'll refer to you. It's one that's really impacted my heart and my heart for um, living the mission every day. And as you listen to it, you can think about the songs. You can pray about these different things in your heart and life. And just see where where is the Lord asking you to go? What's he asking you to do next? And during this time, if you would like prayer for anything, I'm here. I'm going to be up front um, or maybe off to the side here. If you'd like me to pray with you about anything. Okay. So we're going to take about five minutes, and then at the end, I'll come up and I'll close this. Okay. I'm going to take a moment just to pray for us as we go out today. I hope you had a good conversation with the Lord in your reflection time. And... Um, you know, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation for someone. And we get that honor and that privilege to carry this message into the world. So let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that your heart is for people. That you see each of us exactly where we are today. That you know our hearts. That you know our thoughts, God. That you know the next step that you want us to take in living this life on mission for you. God, and I pray that you would fill each of us in this place with the power of your Holy Spirit. God, that it would fill us to give us boldness, to help us to live holy lives, God, to give us that brokenness that we need for the lost. Jesus, would you break our hearts for the people that are around us that are living lives without you? God, who are destined for hell without you, God. Lord, would that be something that hurts us, God, enough that we move with love and compassion to the people that are around us. God, I pray that you would set this place on fire for this community here in Ashland. Would we pray for opportunities? God, would you give us opportunities to speak into people's hearts and lives? God, that we can show them that you are real and that you are true and that you have love and life and peace just waiting for those who would accept you. God, would you make us your witnesses? Would you give us people to disciple in our lives? God, and would you help us as we go? In Jesus' name, amen.